The Secret Doctrine by Elena Petrovna Blavatsky, a facsimile of the original edition of 1888, printed by the Cunningham Press, Alhambra, California. Book 2, Part 1, Anthropogenesis, stanzas translated with commentaries, from the Secret Book of John. Stanza 4, Creation of the First Races. Subsections. Verse 14, Creation of Men. 15, They are empty shadows. 16. The creators are perplexed how to create a thinking man. 17. What is needed for the formation of a perfect man. Verse 14. The seven hosts, the will or mind born, lords propelled by the spirit of life giving, forehat, separate men from themselves, each on his own zone. They threw off their shadows or astral bodies, if such an ethereal being as a lunar spirit may be supposed to rejoice in an astral besides a hardly tangible body. In another commentary it is said that the ancestors breathed out the first man, as Brahma is explained to have breathed out the suras, gods, when they became asuras, from asu, breath. In a third it is said that they, the newly created men, were the shadows of the shadows. With regard to this sentence, they were the shadows of the shadows. A few more words may be said and a full explanation attempted. This first process of evolution of mankind is far easier to accept than the one which follows it, though one and all will be rejected and doubted even by some Kabbalists, especially the Western, who study the present effects but have neglected to study their primary causes. Nor does the writer feel competent to explain a mode of procreation so difficult of appreciation save for an Eastern occultist. Therefore it is useless to enter into details concerning the process, though it is minutely described in the secret books, as it would only lead to speaking of facts hitherto unknown to the profane world, and hence to their being misunderstood. An atom made of the dust of the ground will always be found preferable by a certain class of students to one projected out of the ethereal body of his creator, though the former process has never been heard of, while the latter is familiar, as all know, to many spiritualists in Europe and America, who of all men ought to understand it. For who of those who have witnessed the phenomenon of a materializing form oozing out of the pores of a medium, or at other times out of his left side, can fail to credit the possibility at least of such a birth. If there are in the universe such beings as angels or spirits whose incorporeal essence may constitute an intelligent entity notwithstanding the absence of any to us solid organism, and if there are those who believe that a god made the first man out of dust and breathed into him a living soul, and there are millions upon millions who believe both, what does this doctrine of ours contain that is so impossible? Very soon the day will dawn when the world will have to choose whether it will accept the miraculous creation of man and cosmos too, out of nothing, according to the dead letter of Genesis, or a first man born from a fantastic link, absolutely missing so far the common ancestor of man and of the quote true ape, unquote. Note. Huxley, supported by the most evident discoveries in comparative anatomy, could utter the momentous sentence that the anatomical differences between man and the highest apes are less than those between the latter and the lowest apes. In relation to our genealogical tree of man, the necessary conclusion follows that the human race has evolved gradually from the true apes. The Pedigree of Man by Ernst Haeckel, translated by Edward B. Aveling, page 49. What may be the scientific and logical objections to the opposite conclusion, we would ask? The anatomical resemblances between man and the anthropoids, grossly exaggerated as they are by the Darwinists, as M. de Quatrefage shows, are simply enough, quote, accounted for, unquote, when the origin of the latter is taken into consideration. Quote, nowhere in the older deposits is an ape to be found that approximates more closely to man, or a man that approximates more closely to an ape. Unquote. End of note. Between these two fallacies, occult philosophy steps in. Note. Quote, the same gulf which is found today between man and ape goes back with undiminished breath and death to the tertiary period. This fact alone is enough to make its untenability clear. Unquote. Dr. F. Pfaff, Professor of Natural Science in the University of Erlangen. End of note. It teaches that the first human stock 
was projected by higher and semi-divine beings out of their own essences. If the latter process is to be considered as abnormal or even inconceivable because obsolete in nature at this point of evolution, it is yet proven possible on the authority of certain, quote, spiritualistic, unquote, facts. Which, then, we ask of the three hypotheses or theories is the most reasonable and the least absurd? Certainly no one, providing he is not a soul-blind materialist, can ever object to the occult teaching. Now as shown, we gather from the latter that man was not, quote, created, unquote, the complete being he is now, however imperfect he still remains. There was a spiritual, a psychic, an intellectual and an animal evolution from the highest to the lowest, as well as a physical development from the simple and homogeneous up to the more complex and heterogeneous. They are not quite on the lines traced for us by the modern evolutionists. This double evolution in two contrary directions required various ages of diverse natures and degrees of spirituality and intellectuality to fabricate the being now known as man. Furthermore, the one absolute ever-acting and never-erring law, which proceeds on the same lines from one eternity, or manvantara, to the other, ever furnishing an ascending scale for the manifested, or that which we call the great illusion, Mahamaya, but plunging spirit deeper and deeper into materiality on the one hand, and then redeeming it through flesh and liberating it. This law, we say, uses for these purposes the beings from other and higher planes, men or minds, manus, in accordance with their karmic exigencies. At this juncture the reader is again asked to turn to the Indian philosophy and religion. The esotericism of both is at one with our secret doctrine, however much the form may differ and vary. On the identity and differences of the incarnating powers. The progenitors of man, called in India fathers, Pitara or Pitris, are the creators of our bodies and lower principles. They are ourselves as the first personalities, and we are they. Primeval man would be the bone of their bone and the flesh of their flesh, if they had body and flesh. As stated, they were lunar beings. The endowers of man with his conscious immortal ego are the solar angels, whether so regarded metaphorically or literally. The mysteries of the conscious ego or human soul are great. The esoteric name of these solar angels is literally the Lord's nut of persevering ceaseless devotion, pranidana. Therefore they of the fifth principle, manas, seem to be connected with or to have originated the system of the yogis who make of pranidana their fifth observance. See Yoga Shastra 2.32. It has already been explained why the trans-Himalayan occultists regard them as evidently identical with those who in India are termed Kumaras, Agnishvatas and Bodhishats. How precise and true is Plato's expression, how profound and philosophical his remark on the human solar ego when he defined it as a compound of the same and the other. And yet how little this hint has been understood since the world took it to mean that the soul was the breath of God, of Jehovah. It is the same and the other, as the great initiate philosopher said, for the ego, the higher self, when merged with and in the divine monad, is man, and yet the same as the other, the angel in him incarnated, as the same with the universal Mahat. The great classics and philosophers felt this truth when saying that there must be something within us which produces our thoughts, something very subtle. It is a breath, it is fire, it is ether, it is quintessence, it is a slender likeness, it is an intellection, it is a number, it is harmony, unquote, from Voltaire. All these are the manasam and rajasas, the kumaras, asuras and other rulers and pitris who incarnated in the third race, and in this and various other ways endowed mankind with mind. There are seven classes of Petris as shown below, three incorporeal and four corporeal, and two kinds, the Agnishvata and the Badhishat. 
And we may add that, as there are two kinds of Pitris, so there is a double and a triple set of Barishad and Angshvata. The former, having given birth to their astral doubles, are reborn as sons of Atri, and are the Pitris of the demons, or corporeal beings, on the authority of Manu, 3.196 while the Agnishvata are reborn as sons of Mariki, a son of Brahma, and are the Petris of the gods, Manu again, Matsya and Padma Puranas, and Kuluka in the laws of the Manavas, 3.195. Note, we are quite aware that the Vayu and Matsya Puranas identify agreeably to Western interpretation the Agnishvata with the seasons and the Barhishad Petris with the months adding a fourth class, the caveas, cyclic years. But do not Christian Roman Catholics identify their angels with planets, and are not the seven rishis become the subtarshi, a constellation? They are deities presiding over all the cyclic divisions. End of note. Moreover, the Vayu Purana declares all the seven orders to have originally been the first gods, the Vairayas, whom Brahma, with the eye of yoga beheld in the eternal spheres, and who are the gods of gods. And the Matsya adds that the gods worshipped them, while the Harivansa, S1935, distinguishes the Virayas as one class of the Petris only, a statement corroborated in the secret teachings, which, however, identify the Virajas with the elder Agnishvatas and the Rajasas or Abhuta Rajasas, who are incorporeal without even an astral phantom. Note, the Vayu Purana shows the region called Viraya Loka inhabited by the Agnishvatas. End of note. Vishnu is said in most of the manuscripts to have incarnated in and through them. In the Raivata Manvantara, again, Hari, best of gods, was born of Sambhuti, as the divine Manasas, originating with the deities called Rayasas. Shambhuti was a daughter of Daksha, and wife of Mariki, the father of the Agnishvata, who, along with the Rayasas, are ever associated with Manasas. As remarked by a far more able Sanskritist than Wilson, Mr. Fitz Edward Hall, Quote, Manasa is no inappropriate name for a deity associated with the Rayasas. We appear to have in it Manasam, the same as Manas, with the change of termination required to express male personification. Unquote. See Vishnu Purana, Book 3, Chapter 1, Page 17, Footnote. All the sons of Viraya are Manasa, says Nilakanta. And Viraya is Brahma, and therefore the incorporeal Petrius are called Virayas, from being the sons of Viraya, says Vayu Purana. We could multiply our proofs ad infinitum, but it is useless. The wise will understand our meaning, the unwise are not required to. There are 33 crores, or 330 millions, of gods in India. But as remarked by the learned lecturer on the Bhagavad Gita, they may be all divas, but are by no means all gods in the high spiritual sense one attributes to the term. This is an unfortunate blunder, he remarks, generally committed by Europeans. Deva is a kind of spiritual being, and because the same word is used in ordinary parlance to mean God, it by no means follows that we have to worship 33 crores of gods. And he adds suggestively, these beings, as may be naturally inferred, have a certain affinity with one of the three component upadis, basic principles, into which we have divided man. Unquote from Theosophist, February 1887, Tsekvins. The names of the deities of a certain mystic class change with every manvantara. Thus the twelve great gods, Jayas, created by Brahma to assist him in the work of creation in the very beginning of the Kalpa, and who, lost in Samadhi, neglected to create, whereupon they were cursed to be repeatedly born in each Manvantara till the seventh, are respectively called Aityas, Tushitas, Satyas, Haris, Vaikuntas, Sadyas, and Adityas. They are Tushitas in the second Kalpa, and Adityas in this Vaivasvata period. See Vaipurana, besides other names for each age. But they are identical with the Manasa, or Rayasas, and these with our incarnating Dhyankokhans. They are all classes of the Guanadevas. 
Yes, besides those beings who, like the Yakshas, Gandharvas, Kinaras, etc., etc., taken in their individualities, inhabit the astral plane, there are real Devagnanams. And to these classes of Devas belong the Adityas, the Variyasas, the Kumaras and Asuras, and all those high celestial beings whom occult teaching calls Manashvin, the wise, foremost of all, and who would have made all men the self-conscious, spiritual, intellectual beings they will be, had they not been, quote, cursed, unquote, to fall into generation, and to be reborn themselves as mortals for their neglect of duty. Stanza 4 continued. Verse 15. Seven times seven shadows, kayas, or future men, or amanasas. Manu, as already remarked, comes from the root man to think, hence a thinker. It is from this Sanskrit word very likely that sprung the Latin mens, mind, the Egyptian menis, the mastermind, the Pythagorean monas, or conscious thinking unit, mind also, and even our manas, or mind, the fifth principle in man. Hence these shadows are called amanasa, mindless. With the Brahmins, the Pitris are very sacred, because they are the progenitors or ancestors of men, the first Manushuya on this earth, and offerings are made to them by the Brahmin when a son is born unto him. They are more honored, and their ritual is more important than the worship of the gods. See the Laws of Manu, Book 3, page 203. Note on the progenitors. This was hinted at in Isis Unveil, Volume 1, page 38. Though the full explanation could not then be given, the Petris are not the ancestors of the present living men, but those of the first humankind or Adamic race, the spirits of human races which, on the great scale of descending evolution, preceded our races of men and were physically as well as spiritually far superior to our modern pygmies. In Manava Dharma Shastra, they are called the lunar ancestors. End of note. Now, may we not now search for a philosophical meaning in this dual group of progenitors? The Petris being divided into seven classes, we have here the mystic number again. Nearly all the Puranas agree that three of these are arupa, formless, while four are corporeal, the former being intellectual and spiritual, the latter material and devoid of intellect. Esoterically, it is the Asuras who form the first three classes of Petris, born in the body of night, whereas the other four were produced from the body of twilight. Their fathers, the gods, were doomed to be born fools on earth according to Vayu Purana. The legends are purposely mixed up and made very hazy. The Petris being in one the sons of the gods, and in another those of Brahma, while a third makes them instructors of their own fathers. It is the hosts of the four material classes who create men simultaneously on the seven zones. Now, with regard to the seven classes of Petris, each of which is again divided into seven, a word to students and a query to the profane. That class of the fire dhyanis, which we identify on undeniable grounds with the Agnishvatas, is called in our school the heart of the Dhyankushanic body, and it is said to have incarnated in the third race of men and made them perfect. The esoteric mystagogy speaks of the mysterious relation existing between the hebdomadic essence or substance of this angelic heart and that of man, whose every physical organ and psychic and spiritual function is a reflection, so to say, a copy on the terrestrial plane of the model of prototype above. Why, it is asked, should there be such a strange repetition of the number seven in the anatomical structure of man? Why should the heart have four lower cavities and three higher divisions, answering so strangely to the septenary division of the human principles, separated into two groups, the higher and the lower? And why should the same division be found in the various classes of Petris, and especially our five Dianis? For, as already stated, these beings fall into four corporeal or grosser, and three incorporeal or subtler principles, or call them by any other name you please. Why do the seven nervous plexuses of the body radiate seven rays? Why are there these seven plexuses, and why seven distinct layers in the human skin? 
quote, having projected their shadows and made men of one element, ether, their progenitors reascend to Mahaloka, whence they descend periodically when the world is renewed to give birth to new men. The subtle bodies remain without understanding, manas, until the advent of the suras, gods, now called asuras, not gods, unquote, says the commentary. Not gods for the Brahmins, perhaps, but their highest breaths for the occultists, since those progenitors, Pitar, the formless and the intellectual, refuse to build man but endow him with mind, the four corporeal classes creating only his body. This is very plainly shown in various texts of the Rig Veda, the highest authority for a Hindu of any sect whatever. Therein Asura means spiritual divine, and the word is used as a synonym for supreme spirit. While in the sense of a god, the term Asura is applied to Varuna and Indra, and preeminently to Agni, the three having been in days of old the three highest gods, before Romanical Thea mythology distorted the true meaning of almost everything in the archaic scriptures. But as the key is now lost, the Asuras are hardly mentioned. In the Zendavesta, the same is found. In the Mazdian or Magian religion, Asura is the Lord Asura Vishvavedas the all-knowing omniscient lord. And Asura Majda, become later Ahura Majda, is, as Benfi shows, the lord who bestows intelligence, Ashura Medha and Ahura Mazdao. Elsewhere in this work it is shown on equally good authority that the Indo-Iranian Asura was always regarded as sevenfold. This fact combined with the name Majda as above, which makes of the sevenfold Asura the Lord or Lords collectively, who bestow intelligence, connects the Amshaspens with the Asuras, and with our incarnating the Ankochans, as well as with the Elohim, and the seven informing gods of Egypt, Chaldea, and every other country. Why these, quote, gods, unquote, refused to create men is not, as stated in exoteric accounts, because their pride was too great to share the celestial power of their essence with the children of earth, but for reasons already suggested. However, allegory has indulged in endless fancies, and theology taken advantage thereof in every country to make out this case against the firstborn, or the logui, and to impress it as a truth on the minds of the ignorant and the credulous. Compare also what is said about Makara and the Kumaras in connection with the Zodiac. The Christian system is not the only one which has degraded them into demons. Zoroastrianism and even Brahmanism have profited thereby to obtain hold of the people's mind. Even in Chaldean exotericism, beings who refuse to create, that is, who are said to oppose thereby the Demiurgos, are also denounced as the spirits of darkness. The Suras, who win their intellectual independence, fight the Suras, who are devoid thereof, who are shown as passing their lives in profitless ceremonial worship based on blind faith, a hint now ignored by the orthodox Brahmins, and forthwith the former become Asuras. The first and mind-born sons of the deity refuse to create progeny and are cursed by Brahma to be born as men. They are hurled down to earth, which later on is transformed in theological dogma into the infernal regions. Ahriman destroys the bull created by Ormajd, which is the emblem of the terrestrial elusive life, the germ of sorrow, and, forgetting that the perishing finite seed must die in order that the plant of immortality, the plant of spiritual eternal life, should sprout and live, Ahriman is proclaimed the enemy, the opposing power, the devil. Typhon cuts Osiris into fourteen pieces in order to prevent his peopling the world and thus creating misery, and Typhon becomes, in the exoteric theological teaching, the power of darkness. But all this is the exoteric shell. It is the worshippers of the latter who attribute to disobedience and rebellion the effort and self-sacrifice of those who would help men to their original status of divinity through self-conscious efforts, and it is these worshippers of form who have made demons of the angels of light. Esoteric philosophy, however, teaches that one-third of the Dhyanis, that is, three classes of the Arupa Pitris, endowed with intelligence, which is a formless breath composed of intellectual, not elementary substances, see Harishvama 932, was simply doomed by the law of karma and evolution to be reborn or incarnated on earth. 
Note on one third of the Dianes. Whence the subsequent assertion of St. John's vision referred to in his Apocalypse about the great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, whose tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Chapter 12. End of note. Note on to be reborn or incarnated on earth. The verse did cast them to the earth plainly shows its origin in the grandest and oldest allegory of the Aaron mystics who, after the destruction of Atlantean giants and sorcerers, concealed the truth, astronomical, physical and divine, as it is a page out of pre-cosmic theogony under various allegories. Its esoteric true interpretation is a veritable theodice of the fallen angels, so called, the willing and the unwilling, the creators and those who refuse to create, being now mixed up most perplexingly by Christian Catholics who forget that their highest archangel, St. Michael, who is shown to conquer, to master and to assimilate, the dragon of wisdom and of divine self-sacrifice, now miscalled and calumniated as Satan, was the first to refuse to create. This led to endless confusion. So little does Christian theology understand the paradoxical language of the East and its symbolism that it even explains, in its dead-letter sense, the Chinese, Buddhist and Hindu esoteric rite of raising a noise during certain eclipses to scare away the great red dragon, which laid a plot to carry away the light. But here, light means esoteric wisdom, and we have sufficiently explained the secret meaning of the terms dragon, serpent, etc., etc., all of which refer to adepts and initiates. Some of these were Nimanakayas from other Manvantaras. Hence we see them in all the Puranas, reappearing on this globe in the third Manvantara as kings, rishis and heroes, read third root race. This tenet, being too philosophical and metaphysical to be grasped by the multitudes, was, as already stated, disfigured by the priesthood for the purpose of preserving a hold over them through superstitious fear. The supposed rebels, then, were simply those who, compelled by karmic law to drink the cup of gall to its last bitter drop, had to incarnate anew, and thus make responsible thinking entities of the astral statues projected by their inferior breathing. Some are said to have refused because they had not in them the requisite materials, that is, an astral body, since they were arupa. The refusal of others had reference to their having been adepts and yogis all long past preceding Manvantaras, another mystery. But later on, as Nirmanakayas, they sacrificed themselves for the good and salvation of the monads which were waiting for their turn, and which otherwise would have had to linger for countless ages in irresponsible animal-like, though in appearance human, forms. It may be a parable and an allegory within an allegory, its solution is left to the intuition of the student, if he only reads that which follows with his spiritual eye. As to their fashioners or ancestors, those angels who, in the exoteric legends, obeyed the law, they must be identical with the Barishad, Petris, or the Pita Devata, that is, those possessed of the physical creative fire. They could only create, or rather clothe, the human monads with their own astral selves, but they could not make man in their image and likeness. Man must not be like one of us, say the creative gods, entrusted with the fabrication of the low animal, but higher. See Genesis and Plato's Timaeus. They are creating the semblance of men out of their own divine essence means esoterically that it is they who became the first race and thus shared its destiny and further evolution. They would not, simply because they could not, give to man that sacred spark which burns and expands into the flower of human reason and self-consciousness, for they had it not to give. This was left to the class of divas who became symbolized in Greece under the name of Prometheus to those who had naught to do with the physical body, yet everything with the pure spiritual man. See part two of this volume, The Fallen Angels. Also, the gods of light proceed from the gods of darkness. Each class of creators endows man with what it has to give. The one builds his external form, the other gives him its essence, which later on becomes the human higher self, owing to the personal exertion of the individual. But they could not make men as they were themselves, perfect because sinless, sinless because having only the first pale shadowy outlines of attributes, and these all perfect from the human standpoint, white, pure and cold as the virgins know. 
Where there is no struggle, there is no merit. Humanity of the earth earthy was not destined to be created by angels of the first divine breath. Therefore they are said to have refused to do so, and man had to be formed by more material creators, who in their turn could give only what they had in their own natures, and no more. Note. In spite of all efforts to the contrary, Christian theology, having burdened itself with the Hebrew esoteric account of the creation of man, which is understood literally, cannot find any reasonable excuse for its God, the Creator, who produces a man devoid of mind and sense. Nor can it justify the punishment following an act for which Adam and Eve might plead non compos. For if the couple is admitted to be ignorant of good and evil before the eating of forbidden fruit, how could it be expected to know that disobedience was evil? If primeval man was meant to remain a half-witted, or rather witless being, then his creation was aimless and even cruel, if produced by an omnipotent and perfect God. But Adam and Eve are shown, even in Genesis, to be created by a class of lower divine beings, the Elohim, who are so jealous of their personal prerogatives as reasonable and intelligent creatures that they will not allow man to become as one of us. This is plain even from the dead-letter meaning of the Bible. The Gnostics, then, were right in regarding the Jewish God as belonging to a class of lower, material, and not very holy denizens of the invisible world. End of note. Subservient to eternal law, the pure gods could only project out of themselves shadowy men, a little less ethereal and spiritual, less divine and perfect than themselves, shadows still. The first humanity, therefore, was a pale copy of its progenitors, too material even in its ethereality to be a hierarchy of gods, too spiritual and pure to be men, endowed as it is with every negative, nirguna, perfection. Perfection, to be fully such, must be born out of imperfection. The incorruptible must grow out of the corruptible, having the latter as its vehicle and basis and contrast. Absolute light is absolute darkness and vice versa. In fact, there is neither light nor darkness in the realms of truth. Good and evil are twins, the progeny of space and time, under the sway of Maya. Separate them by cutting off one from the other, and they will both die. Neither exists per se, since each has to be generated and created out of the other, in order to come into being. Both must be known and appreciated before becoming objects of perception, hence in mortal mind they must be divided. Nevertheless, as the illusionary distinction exists, it requires a lower order of creative angels to create inhabited globes, especially ours, or to deal with matter on this earthly plane. The philosophical Gnostics were the first to think so in the historical period, and to invent various systems upon this theory. Therefore, in their schemes of creation, one always finds their creators occupying a place at the very foot of the ladder of spiritual being. With them, those who created our earth and its mortals were placed on the very limit of Mayavic matter, and their followers were taught to think, to the great disgust of the Church Fathers, that for the creation of those wretched races in a spiritual and moral sense, which grace our globe, no high divinity could be made responsible, but only angels of a low hierarchy, to which class they relegated the Jewish god Jehovah. Note on low hierarchy. In Isis Unveiled, several of these Gnostic systems are given. One is taken from the Codex Nazarees, the scriptures of the Nazarenes, who, although they existed long before the days of Christ, and even before the laws of Moses, were Gnostics, and many of them initiates. They held their mysteries of life in Nazara, ancient and modern Nazareth, and their doctrines are a faithful echo of the teachings of the secret doctrine, some of which we are now endeavoring to explain. End of note. Mankind different from the present are mentioned in all the ancient cosmogonies. Plato speaks in the Phaedrus of a winged race of men. Aristophanes in Plato's Banquet speaks of a race androgynous and with round bodies. In Pimander, or the animal kingdom even is double-sexed. Thus in section 18 it is said, The circuit having been accomplished, the knot was loosened, and all the animals, which were equally androgynous, were untied, separated, together with man, 
for, for the causes had to produce effects on earth. Note, see the translation from the Greek by François, Monsieur de Foix, Évesque d'Air, the work dedicated to Marguerite de France, Reine de Navarre, edition of 1579, Bordeaux. End of note. Again, in the ancient Echiché manuscript, the Paul Paul V, published by the late Abbé Brasseur de Bourbourg, the first men are described as a race whose sight was unlimited and who knew all things at once, thus showing the divine knowledge of gods, not mortals. The secret doctrine, correcting the unavoidable exaggerations of a popular fancy, gives the facts as they are recorded in the archaic symbols. Stanza 4 continued. Seven times seven shadows, Kayas of future men or Amanasas, were thus born, each of his own color, complexion, and kind. These shadows were born each of his own color and kind, and also inferior to his creator, because the latter was a complete being of his kind. The commentaries refer the first sentence to the color or complexion of each human race thus evolved. In Pimanda, the seven primitive men created by nature from the heavenly man, all partake of the qualities of the seven governors, or rulers, who loved man, their own reflection and synthesis. In the Norse legends, one recognizes in Asgard, the habitat of the gods, as also in the Arses themselves, the same mystical Loki and personification wound into the popular myths, as in our sacred doctrine, and we find them in the Vedas, the Puranas, the Mazdean scriptures and the Kabbalah the Arses of Scandinavia, the rulers of the world which preceded ours, whose name means literally the pillars of the world. Its supports are thus identical with the Greek cosmocratores, the seven workmen or rectors of Pimanda, the seven rishis and petris of India, the seven Chaldean gods and seven evil spirits, the seven Kabbalistic sephiroth synthesized by the upper triad, and even the seven planetary spirits of the Christian mystics. The Arses create the earth, the seas, the sky, and the clouds, the whole visible world from the remains of the slain giant Ymir. But they do not create man, but only his form from the Ask, or ash tree. It is Odin who endows him with life and soul, after Ludur had given him blood and bones, and finally it is Hornir who furnishes him with his intellect, manas, and with his conscious senses. The Norse Ask, the Hesiodic ash tree, whence issued the men of the generation of bronze, the third root race, and the Zeti tree of the Popol Vuh, out of which the Mexican third race of men was created, are all one. Note, see Max Müller's review of the Popol Vuh, end of note. This may be plainly seen by any reader, but the occult reason why the Norse Yggdrasil, the Hindu Ashvata, the Goggar, the Hellenic tree of life, and the Tibetan Sampun are one with the Kabbalistic Sephirothal tree, and even with the holy tree made by Ahura Mazda, and the tree of Eden, who among the Western scholars can tell. Note, Mr. James Darmestata, the translator of the Vendidad, speaking of it, says, The tree, whatever it is, page 209, end of note. Nevertheless, the fruits of all those trees, whether Pipala or Haoma, or yet the more prosaic apple, are the plants of life, in fact and verity. The prototypes of our races were all enclosed in the microcosmic tree, which grew and developed within and under the great mundane macrocosmic tree, and the mystery is half revealed in the Dirgotamas, where it is said, Pipala, the sweet fruit of that tree upon which come spirits who love the science and where the gods produce all marvels. Note in the micro and macrocosmic trees. See Plato's Timaeus, and of note. As in the Gargard, among the luxuriant branches of all those mundane trees, the, quote, serpent, unquote, dwells. But while the macrocosmic tree is the serpent of eternity and of absolute wisdom itself, those who dwell in the microcosmic tree are the serpents of the manifested wisdom. One is the one and all. The others are its reflected parts. The tree is man himself, of course, and the serpents dwelling in each, the conscious manas, the connecting link between spirit and matter, heaven and earth. Everywhere it is the same, 
the creating powers produce man, but fail in their final object. All these logoi strive to endow man with the conscious immortal spirit reflected in the mind, manas, alone. They fail and they are all represented as being punished for their failure, if not for the attempt. What is the nature of the punishment? A sentence of imprisonment in the lower or neither region, which is our earth, the lowest in its chain, unquote, eternity, unquote meaning the duration of the life cycle in the darkness of matter or within animal man. It has pleased the half-ignorant and half-designing church fathers to disfigure the graphic symbol. They took advantage of the metaphor and allegory found in every old religion to turn them to the benefit of the new one. Thus man was transformed into the darkness of a material hell, his divine consciousness obtained from his indwelling principle, the Manasa, or the incarnated Deva, became the glaring flames of the infernal region, and our globe that hell itself. Pippala, Haoma, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, were denounced as the forbidden fruit, and the serpent of wisdom, the voice of reason and consciousness, remained identified for ages with a fallen angel, which is the old dragon, the devil, we departed to the evil spirit, who or what? The same for the other high symbols. The swastika, the most sacred and mystic symbol in India, the Jaina cross, as it is now called by the Masons, notwithstanding its direct connection and even identity with the Christian cross, has become dishonored in the same manner. It is the devil sign, we are told by the Indian missionaries. Does it not shine on the head of the great serpent of Vishnu, on the thousand-headed Sheshna Ananta, in the depths of Patala, the Hindu Naraka, or hell? It does. But what is Ananta? As Sesha, it is the almost endless manventaric cycle of time, and becomes infinite time itself when called Ananta, the great seven-headed serpent, on which rests Vishnu, the eternal deity, during prolaic inactivity. What has Satan to do with this highly metaphysical symbol? The swastika is the most philosophically scientific of all symbols, as also the most comprehensible. It is the summary in a few lines of the whole work of creation, or evolution, as one would rather say, from cosmotheogony down to anthropogeny, from the indivisible Anon Parabram to the humble Moneron of materialistic science, whose genesis is as unknown to that science as is that of the old deity itself. The swastika is found heading the religious symbols of every old nation. It is the worker's hammer in the Chaldean Book of Numbers, the hammer just referred to in the Book of Concealed Mystery, Chapter 1, subsections 1, 2, 3, and 4, etc., which strike the sparks from the flint, space, those sparks becoming worlds. It is Thor's hammer, the magic weapon forged by the dwarfs against the giants, or the pre-cosmic titanic forces on nature, which rebel, and while alive in the region of matter, will not be subdued by the gods, the agents of universal harmony, but have first to be destroyed. This is why the world is formed out of the relics of the murdered Ymir. The swastika is the Mjölnir, the storm hammer, and therefore it is said that when the Arsis, the holy gods, after having been purified by fire, the fire of passions and suffering in their life incarnations, become fit to dwell in Ida, in eternal peace, when Mjölnir will become useless. This will be when the bonds of Hel, the goddess queen of the region of the dead, will bind them no longer, for the kingdom of evil will have passed away. Certes flames had not destroyed them, nor yet had the raging waters of the several deluges. Then came the sons of Tu. They brought Mjölnir with them, no longer as a weapon of war, but as the hammer with which to consecrate the new heaven and the new earth. Note, see Asgard and the gods, the renewal of the world, end of note. Verily many are its meanings. 
In the macrocosmic work, the hammer of creation with its four arms bent at right angles refers to the continual motion and revolution of the invisible cosmos of forces. In that of the manifested cosmos on our Earth, it points to the rotation in the cycles of time of the world's axis and their equatorial belts. The two lines forming the swastika, meaning spirit and matter, the four hooks suggesting the motion in the revolving cycles. Applied to the microcosm, man, it shows him to be a link between heaven and earth, the right hand being raised at the end of a horizontal arm, the left pointing to the earth. In the smaragdine tablet of Hermes, the uplifted right hand is inscribed with the word Sol, and left with the word coagula. It is at one and the same time an alchemical, cosmogonical, anthropological and magical sign with the seven keys to its inner meaning. It is not too much to say that the compound symbolism of this universal and most suggestive of signs contains the key to the seven great mysteries of cosmos. Born in the mystical conceptions of the earlier Aryans, and by them placed at the very threshold of eternity on the head of the serpent Ananta, it found its spiritual death in the scholastic interpretations of medieval anthropomorphists. It is the Alpha and the Omega of universal creative force, evolving from pure spirit and ending in gross matter. It is also the key to the cycle of science, divine and human, and he who comprehends its full meaning is forever liberated from the toils of Mahamaya, the great illusion and deceiver. The light that shines from under the divine hammer, now degraded into the mallet or gravel of the grand masters of Masonic lodges, is sufficient to dissipate the darkness of any human schemes or fictions. How prophetic are the songs of the three Norse goddesses, to whom the ravens of Odin whisper of the past and the future, as they flutter around in their abode of crystal beneath the flowing river. The songs are all written down in their scrolls of wisdom, of which many are lost, but some still remain, and they repeat in poetical allegory the teachings of the archaic ages. To summarize from Dr. Wagner's Asgard and the Gods, the renewal of the worlds, which is a prophecy about the seventh race of our round told in the past tense. The Mjolnir had done its duty in this round and, quote, on the field of Ida, the field of resurrection for the fifth round, the sons of the highest gods assembled, and in them their fathers rose again, the egos of all their past incarnations. They talked of the past and present, and remembered the wisdom and prophecies of their ancestors which had all been fulfilled. Near them, but unseen of them, was the strong, the mighty one who rules all things, and ordains the eternal laws that govern the world. They all knew he was there, they felt his presence and his power, but were ignorant of his name. At his command, the new earth rose out of the waters of space. To the south, above the field of Ida, he made another heaven called Ordlang, and further off, a third, Vidblan. Over Gimil's cave, a wondrous palace was erected, covered with gold and shining bright in the sun. These are the three gradually ascending planets of our chain. There the gods were enthroned, as they used to be. From Gimel's heights, the seventh planet or globe, the highest and the purest, they looked down upon the happy descendants of Leif and Leifthrasir, the coming Adam and Eve of purified humanity, and signed to them to climb up higher, to rise in knowledge and wisdom step by step from one heaven to another until they were at last fit to be united with the gods in the house of all father. Page 305 He who knows the doctrines of esoteric Buddhism, or wisdom, though so imperfectly sketched hitherto, will see clearly the allegory contained in the above. Its more philosophical meaning will be better understood if the reader thinks carefully over the myth of Prometheus. It is examined further on in the light of the Hindu Pramanta. 
degraded into a purely physiological symbol by some Orientalists, and taken in connection with the terrestrial fire only, their interpretation is an insult to every religion, including Christianity, whose greatest mystery is thus dragged down to matter. The friction of divine Pramanta and Arani could suggest itself under this image only to the brutal conceptions of the German materialists, and whom there are none worse. It is true that the divine babe, Agni, with the Sanskrit-speaking race, who became Ignis with their Latins, is born from the conjunction of Pramanta and Arani, Svastika, during the sacrificial ceremony. But what of that? Twastri, Vishvakarman, is the divine artist and carpenter, and is also the father of the gods and of creative fire in the Vedas. Note on divine artist and carpenter. The father of the sacred fire, writes Professor Jolly, is Twastri. His mother was Maya. He himself was styled Akta, anointed, Christos in Greek, after the priest had poured upon his head the spirituous, within brackets, question mark, Soma, and on his body, butter purified by a sacrifice. Man before metals, page 190. The source of his information is not given by the French Darwinist, but the lines are quoted to show that light begins to dawn even upon the materialists. Adalbert Kuhn, in his Die Herbkunft des Feuers, identifies two signs, the swastika and the swastika punctuated by four dots, with Arani and designates them under this name. He adds, this process of kindling fire naturally led men to the idea of sexual reproduction, etc. Why could not a more dignified idea, and one more occult, have led man to invent that symbol, in so far as it is connected in one of its aspects with the human reproduction? But its chief symbolism refers to cosmogony. Agni in the condition of Akta or anointed, is suggestive of Christ, remarks Professor Jolly. Maya, Mary, his mother, Twastri, St. Joseph the carpenter of the Bible. In the Rig Veda, Vishvakarman is the highest and oldest of the gods and their father. He is the carpenter or builder, because God is called even by the monotheists the architect of the universe. Still, the original idea is purely metaphysical and had no connection with the later phallicism. End or not. So ancient is the symbol and so sacred that there is hardly an excavation made on the sites of old cities without its being found. A number of such terracotta discs, called fusaiolos, were found by Dr. Schliemann under the ruins of ancient Troy. Both these forms the four-dotted swastika and the four-dotted cross with a circle in it, were excavated in great abundance, their presence being one more proof that the ancient Trojans and their ancestors were pure Aryans. Stanza 4, verse 15 continued, Each also inferior to his father, creator. The fathers, the boneless, could give no life to the beings with bones, their progeny were Buddha, phantoms, with neither form nor mind. Therefore they were called the Chaya, image or shadow race. Chaya, as already explained, is the astral image. It bears this meaning in Sanskrit works. Thus, Sanina, spiritual consciousness, the wife of Surya and the sun, is shown retiring into the jungle to lead an ascetic life, and leaving behind to her husband her chaya, shadow or image. Next will be the conclusion of stanza 4.